Summary of So You Want to Talk About Race by Ijeoma Alyo. At the beginning of the book, she talks about how her life has been changed by being a black woman in the United States. She believes racism is widespread in the United States, which is why she's making this book to help people have better talks about it. She says that these talks are naturally uncomfortable for both privileged and oppressed people, but she urges everyone to accept their discomfort in order to reduce racial inequality. Aluo believes that those who say that class should be the goal of social justice efforts instead of race are wrong. Aluo says that the U.S. society was built on the idea of racial injustice, starting with the killing of Native Americans and the slavery of black people. Aluo believes that people in power stole land and power from people of color in order to build up their own wealth and power in the U.S. You will get more because other people get less is still a concept that she thinks drives U.S. society. This means that it works to keep the cycle of taking from people of color to help rich white guys going. Aluo also says that injustice in the U.S. is like cancer. He says that racism and classism are both types of cancer. Both need to be dealt with because treating one won't help the other. Aluo says that changing people's minds about racism isn't the answer. Instead, she says, we need to change a system, which she calls a machine, that supports and encourages racist behavior. She says that changing someone's mind is like addressing the sickness that cancer causes instead of the cancer itself, which is the system that makes haters. Aluo agrees that many white people, including her own mother, say hurtful or inappropriate things when they talk about race without meaning to. To avoid this, she tells white people not to think they know what it's like to be black just because they know black people. She also tells them not to demand that people of color learn about race or that their tone of voice be regulated, since this is like asking people who are already struggling to do extra emotional work. Aluo then talks about power and diversity. She says status means having some benefits in life that other people don't have. Aluo says that if it's easier for her to get a job because she's a light-skinned black woman, it's because her bosses think that black women are less smart than white women, which is racist. The same belief keeps women with dark skin from getting chances, which makes more opportunities for other people. I agree with Aluo that bias affects more than one group. There are many things that can make someone favored, like being able-bodied, male, or neurotypical. Aluo says people should try to get rid of the unfair situations that give them extra power by using the extra power that their advantage gives them. For Aluo, that's what check your privilege means. Using race theorist Kimberly Crenshaw as an example, Aluo adds to the idea of intersectionality by saying that social justice groups fail when organizers don't think about their own advantage in relation to other people in their group. Women may feel oppressed compared to men, but they may not realize how favored they are compared to other women, who may also be oppressed by racism, ableism, transphobia, classism, and other things. So, Aluo says that the fight for social justice needs to include a lot of different groups. Feminists, for instance, should fight against all the things that make life hard for women, even if those things don't directly affect them. Aluo then talks about police violence and affirmative action. People of color in the U.S. are afraid for their lives when they are pulled over by police, according to her. Sandra Bland died while in police custody after being stopped for a traffic violation. Aluo says the problem isn't just a few racist police officers. Instead, it's about the ways that society supports racist ideas, like the media and news cycle that constantly portrays black people as violent and dangerous, and lets police act on those ideas by letting them abuse, jail, and kill black people more than white people without being held accountable. So, what needs to be changed is the system. Aluo believes that policies like affirmative action, which can be used to pay college scholarships for people of color, do just that. She says that these kinds of programs don't try to give people of color unfair benefits, instead, they just try to lessen the effects of a system that leaves people of color out too often. Aluo adds to this idea when she talks about the pipeline from school to jail, which she says is another result of racism that is built into the system. As Aluo puts it, 
structural systems like media portrayals of black people as violent thugs teach teachers in a sneaky way that black kids are more likely to be violent. This means that when kids of color act out, teachers are more likely to see it as aggressive behavior. As a result, they are more likely to suspend, expel, or name these kids with learning problems. These punishments stay on kids' records, which makes it harder for them to get into college and more likely that they will end up in youth detention and then jail, because they have a history of disobeying rules. It also teaches black and brown kids that they will get in trouble for being too excited, loud, or unruly, which takes away their fun as kids. Aluos then talks about racial slurs, especially the N-word. Aluo says this term makes people of color think of slavery, murder, and other violent events in the past. So, using these names causes deep emotional pain and makes people of color deal with the emotional work of being hurt while going about their daily lives. Taking care of painful feelings is hard in and of itself, and it takes energy away from other things that people of color could be doing to make their lives better which makes them even more on the outside. Next, Aluo talks about ethnic plunder. She says that cultural appropriation is when someone takes food, dress, performance styles, symbols, or other things that belong to a culture that is being mistreated. Aluo gives the examples of white rappers, fusion restaurants run by white cooks, and people who wear Native American headdresses or bindis as fashion items. Aluo says that these kinds of actions make race injustice worse. She says that white cooks who serve Americanized fusion food are more likely to get praise from white reviewers. This means that their restaurants are more likely to do well than real ethnic restaurants owned and run by people of color. It's also harder for black rappers whose music sounds different from white rappers to get record deals when white rappers become popular. Aluo says that if it's easier for versions of cultural practices that have been stolen to do well in business than real ethnic versions, then society prefers its culture cloaked in whiteness. Aluo says this means people think that edited versions of things, like black music, are safer and better for U.S. society, which supports white dominance. This is where Aluo talks about small offenses against black people, like touching their hair, asking them where they're really from or saying that someone doesn't sound black. Microaggressions are used by a lot of people without trying to. This is a sign of a society that normalizes racist behavior, Aluo says. Because they happen so often, Aluo says microaggressions are a problem. They're like punches that hit someone where they're already hurt. A microaggression is when someone of color is treated badly. This makes them feel bad which makes it hard for them to focus on what they need to do at that very moment. These small offenses happen over and over again, and over time, they hurt their chances of success in life. When someone is told they used a microaggression, Aluo says the best thing to do is to say sorry and accept the pain it caused. Someone hurt a person of color, even if they didn't mean to. Aluo believes that people should apologize for the hurt they caused and learn from it so that they don't do it again. They shouldn't try to explain away the small offense by saying they meant well. Aluo goes back to the subject of schools to say that young students of color are angry because it's becoming more and more clear to them that the system is against them now that Trump is president. Aluo tells her readers that anger is a normal reaction to the unfair situation of racial oppression. She also tells older people to back up the young people who are fighting back against the systems of power that keep them down. The next part by Aluo talks about the model minority myth, which says that Asian Americans are good or successful minorities when they are not. Aluo disagrees with this because numbers show that a lot of Asian Americans, especially Bangladeshi, Hmong, and second-generation Chinese Americans, have real problems getting jobs and going to school. It's important to be intersectional and include their needs in the social justice agenda as well. Lastly, Aluo talks about how to handle tough feelings when talking about race again. She stresses that the point of these chats, no matter how hard they are, is to get people to take action against systemic racism. According to Aluo, it is unfair to ask people of color to talk about racism in a nice way. It asks people of color to watch how they talk about racism so that it doesn't bother white people, 
which is unfair and requires extra work from angry people who are entitled to be angry. When white people are called out on their racism, they often defend themselves because they don't like facing their own racism. Instead of acting out in defense, which hurts vulnerable people even more, Aluo tells these people to take a moment when this happens. Aluo ends by telling her readers that the point of all these tough talks about race isn't to make rich people feel better by letting it all out. Instead, the goal is to get people to fight against a structure that makes racist behavior seem normal. Aluo knows this is a tough job, but he thinks it can be done. Aluo comes to the conclusion that being blasé about these kinds of problems is racist because it lets an unfair system keep going. So, she tells people to do something. In this case, when someone chooses for a district attorney who is more dedicated to fighting police corruption than their opponent, they are taking a step toward breaking down the effects of a white racist system. Aluo says, we can do this together, even though the road ahead is long. About the author. Ijeoma Aluo was born to a black father from Nigeria and a white mother. She describes herself as a black queer woman. In her book So You Want to Talk About Race, Aluo writes about many parts of her childhood in parenting. Aluo talks about being poor as a child in the United States and how they often didn't have access to water or power and often went hungry. A lot of her childhood memories are about being poor and being black. Aluo went to college while being a divorced mother of one. She graduated from Western Washington University with a degree in political science when she was 27 years old. After that, she worked in digital marketing and technology while also writing a food blog on the side from Seattle, Washington. A 12-year-old black boy named Tamir Rice was shot and killed by police in 2014 while playing with a toy gun. This is the same age as Aluo's own son. This made Aluo start writing about racism on her blog. She speaks out against racism and sexism in popular media, especially when it comes to the black female voice being erased. The book So You Want to Talk About Race came out in 2018. The book got a lot of praise for how honestly it dealt with racism, especially from the New York Times, Bustle, and Harper's Bazaar. Aluo's work is known for using personal stories, usually about racially charged events that happened in her daily life, to show how racism affects society as a whole in the U.S. Hope we summarized it fully and you liked it. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that we are motivated to create more videos.